Welcome, everyone. And welcome to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Um, this may not make me f some friends in this crowd, but I'm going to make the argument that there are very few true physician scientists, right? When you really get down to brass tacks and look at people that have succeeded in both worlds, I would argue that anywhere, in U.S. or otherwise, it's quite unusual. And our, our guest today, Dr. Aaron Schimmer from the University of Toronto, is someone I would define as a true physician scientist. And let me let me explain what I mean by that. So first off, first of all, if you look at his education, um, he started in 1989 in, in medical school, did his medical training, then did residency and fellowship, and while he was a fellow, he was also pursuing his PhD at the University of Toronto, where he completed that, and then did uh, subsequent two or three years of postdoctoral training. So that was a long, hard road doing them both independently and simultaneously, um, working in a lab, I think, pretty much the entire time. Um, subsequent to that, he became an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in 2003. Uh, where he's had a very successful research laboratory, um, incredibly productive in those subsequent years with uh, over 200 uh, papers published, uh, many of them in high-profile journals in really cutting-edge areas. Um, during that time, while he was running a very large, very successful laboratory, uh, he was also very actively involved in clinical trials. He was a PI on 10 different leukemia trials over that of a decade or so from about 2005 on. And very interestingly, and really, if you really want to push the definition of a physician scientist, three trials directly um, studies from his laboratory where they made basic science discoveries that had clinical ramifications that then went to a clinical trial based directly on the work from his laboratory. So that's really quite an extraordinary accomplishment. We talk about translating stuff, but this doesn't happen very often. So I give him enormous credit for, for his success in that area. Um, he's, of course, uh, got a, a long list of, of uh, titles and so forth. I won't, I won't uh, take the time to go through, and he's been very successful in all other aspects of academic. And lastly, you know, he's actually not born in Canada, but he's lived his whole life in Canada, and like all Canadians I've ever met, he's just a lovely guy. So Aaron, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. It's really been a great time uh, visiting here. Over the next uh, 45, 50 minutes or so, wanted to talk with you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing in AML, and uh, these are my disclosures. Um, give you initially sort of the lay of the land where I think things are with this disease. You know, it's, it's amazing how it's changed so dramatically in just a couple of years. And then kind of segue with that into some of the research that we're doing around developing new therapeutic strategies for this disease. You know, and every time I used to go and speak, that this would sort of be my introductory slide. And the nice thing was I really didn't have to work too hard to keep up with the field, but I used this slide probably for a good 16 years, and it was essentially unchanged. And what I would say is that, you know, it's, it's a disease with a, a significantly unmet need that you look at survival curves, and that survival, although improving over the decades, that improvement was really due to improvements in supportive care and transplant, that there were, in the period of 2000 to 2016, only one drug with a sustained FDA-approved indication for AML, and that was arsenic for, uh, for APL. And even that, it was hard to argue that was a new drug. But I got to tell you, over the last two years, there's been an explosion of new therapies in this disease that really, I think, in my opinion, have stemmed from an improved understanding of the biology of this disease. And, you know, so now, like, you know, as a, a joke, oh, sure, here we go. So is, is, is this better? Okay. You know, I, 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 you know, Dan was joking with me that, you know, before you give the talk, you have to check the FDA website to see what's new in the disease, and that's really been true. You know, and so, in, so in 2017 alone, we, we saw the approval of mitostorin for FLT3-mutated AML and acidinib for patients with relapse refractory disease and an IDH2 mutation. Gemtuzumab, ozogomycin, this is an anti-CD33 antibody conjugated with the toxin collegiomycin, was reapproved as a single agent or in combination for AML. And then CPX351, which is a liposomal formulation of Donnarubis and an ARC, was approved for therapy-related AML or MDS-related changes. And 2018 also saw to be a banner year for this disease. Again, remember, a disease where you saw nothing for well over 20 to 30 years, right? So, so uh, for um, IDH1, that should be IDH1 inhibitor uh, patients, so IDH1 inhibitors for patients with relapse refractory 
disease gilteritinib, the FLT3 inhibitor for relapse refractory AML with a FLT3 mutation, the uh, hedgehog inhibitor glastigib in combination with low-dose RSC for patients with newly diagnosed AML, and something here that actually that this institute has really been the one to spearhead, the uh, venetoclax combinations for patients with newly diagnosed AML over 75 or those unfit for induction chemotherapy. And I would argue that at least at some level, many of these new therapies have been a direct result of our improved understanding of the biology of this disease. And much of this improved understanding came a result of the efforts to sequence the mutations in AML. So this is work from 2013 where they set out to sequence using bulk samples the genetic mutations in AML. And what they identified is that AML patients have an average five or six mutations and that there are a discrete series of mutations um, that are identified frequently involving mutations in FLT3 or NPM1, but many epigenetic um, muta uh, mutations in epigenetic genes, you know, at least in part suggesting that AML may be an epigenetic disease. And this has led to the new th uh, prognostic markers, new MRD markers, and then now most recently new therapeutic targets. And so just to give you one example about how this is being translated into the clinic in the way of new uh, therapeutic targets, I, I think the identification of FLT3 mutations represents a good, good example. So FLT3 mutations, at least ITDs, or tr uh, transmembrane duplications of the juxtamembrane domain, occur in 25% uh, of AML patients. And so for FLT3 is a reminder, is a receptor tyrosine kinase that sends uh, growth signals and confers chemoresistance by activation of the PI3 kinase and AKT pathways. And mutations in the ITD or, or the juxtamembrane duplication result in constitutive activation of the kinase constitutive activation of these signaling pathways that ultimately results in proliferation and chemoresistance. And here's some of the data demonstrating the prognostic importance of the FLT3 mutation. If you look at cytogenetics, which up until the molecular mutations have been the best way to risk stratify patients, you could stratify patients into good, intermediate, and poor risk. And you could then further stratify that or further classify that by adding in the presence or absence of the FLT3 mutation. In all cytogenetic risk categories, the presence of the FLT3 mutation results in a worse outcome and increased risk of relapse. But I think it's most clinically relevant in patients who've got standard risk disease, whereas in the absence of the FLT3 mutation, the risk of relapse is approximately 48%, whereas in patients who have the FLT3 mutation and standard risk cytogenetics, now you have a risk of relapse that approaches 75%. But it was quickly realized that patients don't just have a single mutation, that they have a combination of mutations. And so, in fact, what you can do is you can begin to start to look at the effects of combinations on relapse and survival. And here's just an example of two mutations and how you can begin to think about the permutations in combination. So this is NPM1 and FLT3 mutations. The idea here isn't to go through all of the different curves, but rather to point out that you can identify one group of patients. Those would be patients with an NPM1 mutation who have wild-type FLT3, that these patients have a better outcome than the other groups of patients. And then you can begin to identify groups that you might not be transplanting in the upfront setting. But the challenge, of course, is, as I said, patients are actually having, on average, five or six mutations. And as we think about the field now that we're doing more molecular profiling, I think it's going to become increasingly challenging to figure out what any given patient's survival would look like when you consider, actually, the combination of mutations that they have. One of the ways that I think things are going is actually sort of through machine learning and big data science and being able to kind of bring together a large number of these data to, be, to better sort of risk stratify for your individual patient. And I thought this was actually a very interesting publication from just a couple of years ago that this group here compiled or developed an algorithm by incorporating the outcomes of thousands of patients and incorporating their clinical demographics with their molecular mutations. And now, in fact, what's interesting is you can go on to their online website, 
You can input your patient's molecular profile, you can put in some basic clinical demographics, and it will generate a survival curve based on the data that it has as to what the likely outcome of this patient would be, considering whether you give them chemotherapy with or without transplant in, at all or with or without transplant in first remission. And I think algorithms like this are going to become more and more popular as we think about being best able to predict the patient's outcome. One of the things, and we'll kind of get to this in a little bit, is that this assumes that your standard therapy, though, is unchanged. This is all built around the backbone of standard induction chemotherapy. But of course, if you don't actually use that same standard induction chemotherapy, then all these data would have to be rederived for your new therapeutic approach. In addition to defining new prognostic markers, the genetic mutation profiles also identified new therapeutic targets. And we've seen these now advancing into the clinic and now approved for clinical use. Again, I, I, I think the mitostorin, although now not the most recent example of new approved therapies for this disease, really become a way to think about the therapeutic development uh, uh, of drugs for AML. And so recently, there was a uh, clinical trial where they demonstrated that the addition of mitostorin to standard induction chemotherapy improved outcome for patients with AML. And, and these are the data here. This is, uh, they, again, they randomized patients to standard donorubicin plus ARC or donorubicin plus ARC plus mitostorin. And they showed that the addition of mitostorin produced no difference in rates of remission, but the addition of mitostorin decreased rates of relapse, improved overall survival and relapse-free survival. And what was interesting, I think, to me is that the rates of transplant were actually equal in the two groups. So it wasn't that mitostorin was just helping prevent relapse and getting more patients to transplant. I think what it was doing was actually eliminating some of the clones responsible for relapse disease. But, you know, when you look at mitostorin, these, these are kinase tree diagrams. And mitostorin, despite perhaps you know, what some may suggest, mitostorin is not a selective FLT3 inhibitor. So if you look at the tree diagrams, the, the way you read these is each dot represents a different kinase inhibited by the drug. And the larger the dot, the more potent inhibitor. So if you look at a, a, a drug like mitostorin, it's very hard to argue that this is a selective FLT3 inhibitor. And in fact, you know, I think there's reason to think that much of the clinical benefit that one is seeing from mitostorin is due to inhibition of targets well beyond FLT3. In fact, there may even be use of this drug in non-FLT3 mutated AML, and those trials are currently ongoing. The other aspect, or the other way to look at this as well, what if you use more selective FLT3 inhibitors? And so drugs like AC220, also now known as quizartinib, were developed later and, and are much more selective FLT3 inhibitors. So these are the kinase tree diagrams. And these are the results that were recently presented at ASH. And what we're seeing is that uh, with, with the use of quizartinib compared to salvage chemotherapy and relapse refractory AML, that you could actually get improved outcomes using quizartinib compared to standard uh, chemotherapy approaches. And, and while better in terms of outcome, I would also say that the use of the quizartinib is much less cytotoxic. Uh, one of the challenges, though, with the use of the quizartinib is that the, uh, the time of remission or the duration of remission is more limited. And in many cases, the duration of remission is only in the order of 11 weeks. So look, you know, I mean, 11 weeks for a patient with relapse refractory disease, I guess, you know, if you're that patient or that family, look, 11 weeks is clearly important. But, you know, in terms of tra a transformative therapy, you know, it's unclear then how much 11 weeks is important. But I guess that also sort of highlights that FLT3 may not be a driver of AML biology, but there still may be value, however, because if you can use these FLT3 inhibitors to achieve remission and get patients on to transplant, then that becomes a very useful bridging strategy. So one of the things which then I, I want to move to is then venetoclax with low-dose chemotherapy. Look, you know, so here to come to Colorado and tell you and tell Dan about, you know, the data he's generating, you know, I mean, far be it for me to do this. But look, you know, I think it's important to recognize, at least I think, just how transformative that, you know, some of these data have become. That, you know, and, and this is work that uh, Dan and Craig and, 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 and Courtney have published, but have looked at, the outcome of patients receiving azocytidine venetoclax 
to historical controls receiving induction chemotherapy. And here, I mean, the, not only are they at least equivalent, and you could argue even if they were equivalent, this would be a massive advance because of the toxicity. But, but, but they're actually showing dramatically improved survival, at least compared to historical controls. And, and it's, so, so, you know, for me, I think this is very dramatic that you're seeing response rates that at the very least compared to what you can achieve with induction chemotherapy and, it, and response rates across subgroups that were otherwise considered poor. And so, you know, you go and you've got all of these genetic markers and all of this prognostic work that you've been doing, but as you change therapy, in fact, all that goes out the window. But, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, Dan will, will tell you this or not, but I actually would argue that the combination of, of venetoclax and azocytine society was as much serendipity as it was science. You know, and I think the reality was is that two drugs that had marginal activity by themselves were combined, because frankly, that's what we do as clinicians. And you know what, Dan got lucky. But I would actually argue that, you know, and, and we think about the lab, and we think about sort of these serendipitous findings that we get in the lab being such important drivers of, of our research programs. And for some reason, when that happens in the lab, everyone says, well, of course, that's the way you do science. But in, in the clinic, for some reason, people don't like to think about that in the clinic. But, but I would actually argue that clinical serendipity is as important for driving our clinical advances as any science behind this. And in fact, if you look at many of the approvals that we've just had over the last two years, I would argue that serendipity has really been what's driven the progress. And so azocytic and venetoclax, certainly, but might store it, right? So, so I, I think there's good evidence to think that the clinical improvement they saw has got nothing to do with inhibiting FLT3, that might is actually a multi-kinase inhibitor, and that's why it works. One of the best is CPX351. So this is a liposomal formulation of donorubicin and ARC. And you look at the company's preliminary data where they try to demonstrate that they've combined these drugs in fixed molar ratio. Well, frankly, the synergy that they're showing with their fixed molar ratio at best is marginal. And really, why is the drug working? The drug is working because it looks like it's preferentially targeting to the leukemic cells and the stem cell populations over the normal uh, cells and other tissues in the body. And so in the end, you get improved efficacy and decreased toxicity because of your targeting agent, and it's got nothing to do with your molar ratio. And finally, gemtuzumab ozogomycin, well, that was taken off the market because of lack of efficacy, and the only reason it was brought back is someone decided they would just try a different dosing schedule with no particular rationale. So again, right, you know, clinical serendipity, I think, is a large part to play in our development of drugs. But I also think that our ability to target the genetic mutations is going to be somewhat limited. That certainly if you look at the FLT3 inhibitors, that while the response rates are significant, these are not drivers of AML. Even IDH1 and IDH2 inhibitors, although clearly important, have produced, you might argue, modest responses. And I think we're reaching the limit of the number of druggable mutations that we have. And so as a result, I think we're going to need to start to look at things that are downstream of these genetic mutations and things also that target the leukemic stem cells that are at least a large part of relapse disease. And that's sort of then the segue into some of the research that we've been doing in my lab, looking at trying to develop new therapeutic strategies for AML and looking at ways to target mitochondrial, mitochondrial, mitochondrial metabolism. And in fact, you know, but, but, the, but the truth is that we, we became interested in targeting mitochondria not because of a predetermined effort to look at this organelle. We actually got into this because of a screen that we had done where we looked for known on-patent and off-patent drugs with previously unrecognized ability to target the uh, leukemia stem cells. And here what we did is we compiled a library of on-patent and off-patent drugs. We focused ourselves on antimicrobials and metabolic regulators just simply because we thought that trying to reposition a narcotic or an anesthetic for leukemia was just going to be completely impractical. And, and so we compiled this library, and we, we obtained a, a, a cell line from John Dick's lab, text leukemia cells that have properties of leukemia stem cells. And we screened this library, and one of our top hits, actually the second top hit, was the antimicrobial tigacycline. So tigacycline is an uh, on-patent antimicrobial. It's used for the treatment of gram-positive and gram-negative infections, but its anti-leukemic activity had never been previously described. And uh, we then uh, took a look at the effects of tigacycline. We looked at it in cell lines and showed that it induced death in leukemia cell lines. And we also looked at primary AML and normal hematopoietic cells. And we showed that at least in the subgroup of AML cells, treatment with tigacycline reduced growth and viability. And we thought it was occurring at concentrations that we thought were pharmacologically achievable. 
But in contrast, normal hematopoietic cells, including the CD34 plus progenitors, were largely resistant to the drug. And we'll come back in a little bit and talk about why there might be some of these differences between these groups of patients. But having shown its effects in the bulk cells, the question is what was happening to the stem cell populations or the progenitors? And so we did a number of experiments looking at whether tigacycline was able to target the stem and progenitor populations. So first we took primary AML patient samples, we treated them in culture, and then either plated them into clonogenic growth assays or engrafted them into mice. And we, and we did similar experiments when we treated normal hematopoietic cells. And what we see is that treatment of the primary AML cells significantly reduces the clonogenic growth, but there's very little effect on the clonogenic growth of the normal hematopoietic cells. Likewise, if you treat the cells and engraft them into mice, then you significantly reduce the engraftment of the leukemic cells, but again, have very little impact engraftment of normal cells. But of course, the better way to do the experiment is not necessarily to treat the cells in culture, but actually first to engraft the primary samples into mice, allow the cells to engraft for a couple days. We then treated them for two weeks, sacrificed the mice, harvested the femurs, fleshed the femurs, and looked at the engraftment of the primary patient samples in the mouse marrow. And when we do this with AML cells, we see significant reductions of the engraftment of the leukemia in the mouse marrow. And we then actually went on to do secondary transplants and showed that we were able to target the stem cells. But we also could do similar experiments where instead of engrafting AML patient samples into mice, if we engrafted normal cells, then we see no difference in the normal cell engraftment. So suggesting already that there's maybe some preferential ability to target the leukemic cells and stem cells over normal cells. But the question for us then became, so how is this drug working? Because although it was understood to be an antimicrobial, its, its effects in eukaryotic cells was not known. And to try to get at this issue, we uh, established a collaboration with Guri Gaver and Corey Nislow. So Guri and Corey are yeast biologists. And if you asked me a number of years ago, wait, well, you know, what would I ever have in common with yeast biologists? But it turns out that Guri and Corey have developed a really innovative platform to understand drug targets and drug mechanism of action. So they've developed a, um, a yeast-based assay where they've barcode, where they've heterozygously or homozygously deleted each of the genes in the yeast genome and then genetically barcoded these yeast. And so the idea here is that when you treat your pool of yeast with your drug of interest, if you've deleted the gene that's the drug target or important in the drug pathway, those yeasts will be particularly sensitive uh, to your drug. And so here operationally what we did is we treated the yeast with tigacycline. We then harvested the yeast, isolated the DNA. At the time we used microarray, but now of course you would use sequencing and then look at the dropouts from the screen. So the idea is that the dropouts from the screen represent the, the hits and the drug targets or mechanism of action. And the top hit from the screen were components of the mitochondrial ribosome. And so as, as a reminder, so mitochondria contain their own DNA, but they also have their, protein, their own protein initiation apparatus, their own protein elongation apparatus, their own mitochondrial ribosomes, and their own protein degradation proteases as well. And the, and the mitochondrial DNA encodes for 13 proteins, all of which make up the, the respiratory chain. And so as a reminder then, in the electron transport chain or the respiratory chain, electrons generated through the TCA cycle are passed through complexes 1 through 5, and as they pass between the complexes with coenzyme Q and cytochrome C, hydrogen ions are pumped across the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane and then in the process creating a negative electrical gradient. These hydrogen ions then flow back through the membrane through complex 5, resulting in the generation of ATP, and in the process oxygen is consumed. And all the complexes except complex 2 have components encoded by mitochondrial DNA. And we showed that treatment with tigacycline inhibited mitochondrial protein synthesis, it reduced levels of mitochondrial encoded proteins, but not nuclear encoded proteins. It reduced the activity of respiratory chain complexes, all except complex two, which is the one that has only nuclear components, and decreased mitochondrial membrane potential and oxygen consumption. And we showed that all of these changes then were functionally important for the effects of tigacycline on leukemia cell and stem cell viability. So one of the things though that we also then try to understand is why are, or why are some AML samples more sensitive than others? <clears throat> 
And we showed that there seemed to be a correlation with mitochondrial mass. And so AML samples with greater mitochondrial mass were more sensitive to tigacycline. But for us, of course, that didn't fully explain why should AML cells then be more sensitive, because I, I didn't really see the immediate connection to mitochondrial mass. And so we went on and we looked at levels of complexes, and we could see no difference between AML and normal in the level of complexes. We looked at the complex activity and could see no difference. But we did actually see a difference in spare reserve capacity. So as a reminder for those who may be less familiar, spare reserve capacity represents the difference between the basal oxygen consumption and the maximal oxygen consumption. And for those who don't do this on a regular basis, I, I try to uh, give the analogy that thinking about the spare reserve capacity is like thinking about a car engine. So a car engine, a car is going a certain speed. The engine can go somewhat faster to its maximal speed. And that difference between the current speed and the maximal speed is the spare reserve capacity. In AML cells, you might argue, are sort of like that old uh, 57 Chevy compared to the normal cells, which are more of the souped-up portion. So the, the AML cells are going slightly faster than the normal cells. Their oxygen consumption is slightly faster, but their maximal speed is slightly lower, and their spare reserve capacity is less. And so when you start to target oxidative phosphorylation, we think we're going to preferably start to impact on the AML cells compared to normal cells. Further... Uh, in, you know, insights, I think, into the unique vulnerabilities of the leukemic cells have also come from a couple of recent papers. Uh, Lottie Kuntz and A.L. Uh, Gottlieb's lab looked at CML cells and stem cells. And what they showed is that the CML cells and stem cells had greater flux of metabolites into the TCA cycle. And, and as a result of that, that this was probably contributing to the decreased spare reserve capacity that they were seeing and also led to increased rates of oxygen consumption and also rendered these cells more sensitive to strategies that targeted oxidative phosphorylation. But of course, you know, again, here coming here, I, I'm going to tell you about Courtney's work. But anyway, I think this is actually really important too. You know, uh, Courtney and Craig have had a really exciting paper recently looking at the effects of amino acid metabolism in uh, leukemia stem cells and showed that they're particularly sensitive. One of the messages that I really liked about this paper, though, I, I'm not sure you played this up as prominently, but I thought it was really cool, was that the leukemic stem cells were metabolically inflexible. And that when depriving the uh, stem cells of one so source of fuel, they were unable to upregulate other compensatory pathways, unlike normal cells. And I think that, again, starts to start to understand why are leukemic cells particularly vulnerable to strategies that target mitochondrial metabolism. So... One of the reasons that we actually started into um, our drug uh, repurposing or, or screening no, known drug libraries was the ability to, to move more rapidly from the lab into the clinic. So within about a year to year and a half of identifying tigacycline as a hit from our screen, we then transitioned into a phase one study of tigacycline in patients with relapse and refractory disease. Um, we dose escalated from the usual antimicrobial dose up to 300 milligrams per day. And in the context, we're conducting correlative studies. No, so, uh, oops. You know, so, so, of course, this is the part in the talk where I'm supposed to show you the slides like Dan, where you've got all these remissions, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, we didn't actually see that. And, and one of the challenges actually turned out to be the half-life of the drug was much shorter in our study than the published literature. And so as a reversible inhibitor of mitochondrial protein synthesis, we uh, actually probably weren't on target long enough to see uh, clinical effects. But we've since actually reestablished a formulation that would allow us to give more sustained uh, dosing. So I think it actually remains a little bit unclear about at least the potential therapeutic utility of targeting mitochondrial protein synthesis in leukemia. But from a scientific perspective, though, that sort of opened up this area for us, and we began to ask, so if targeting the mitochondrial ribosome may be effective in leukemia, what are some other uh, pathways in acute leukemia that may represent new biologic vulnerabilities, and in particular around, of course, the mitochondria? And so here what we did is to try to get at these new vulnerabilities, we conducted a genome-wide shRNA screen. And so at the time we used K562 cells, and we infected them with a barcoded uh, shRNA library of approximately 54,000 shRNA targeting just a little bit over 11,000 genes. And just to point out that the uh, top hits in, uh, from our genome-wide screen are BCR and ABLE, and K562 cells have the BCR-ABLE translocation, and so we felt we had validated the, uh, the shRNA screen. <clears throat> 
And when we look then at the mitochondrial proteome, so these are roughly the uh, 1,300 or so genes that are encoded by the nucleus, translated in the cytoplasm, and then imported into the mitochondria, looking for what genes uh, would be necessary for the growth and viability of AML cells. Now, interestingly, among the list, among the top 20 or so hits, mitochondrial proteases were leading candidates. And in particular, we became very interested about the mitochondrial protease CLIP-P. So, so this is a, a serine protease, CLIP-P. It's located in the mitochondrial matrix, but really very little to anything was known about what the function of this uh, protease was in the mitochondria. But structurally, it looked very similar to the uh, proteasome that we know about. So it's a barrel-shaped enzymatic core capped on either end with a regulatory subunit. And there's a, a, mitoc there's a bacterial homologue that goes by the same name, that's been a, in a bit better studied. And in the bacteria, this regulatory subunit called CLIPEX is responsible for recognizing bacterial proteins, unfolding them, and then feeding them into the barrel-shaped enzyme core. And in bacteria anyway, inhibiting CLIP-P is able to eradicate a subgroup of bacteria. And interestingly, it's able to eradicate bacterial persisters. So these are the bacteria that, that are... Uh, important for uh, chronic infections. And you might think of them as sort of the stem cells of the bacterial world. And it's interesting that targeting clip P can eliminate those bacteria. But what would happen if you targeted clip P in cancer hadn't been previously uh, shown. So before getting into that question, we started to say, well, you know, what's the expression of clip P like in AML? And so we collaborated with Steve Kornblau at the MD Anderson, who had set up reverse phase protein arrays, and we looked at the expression of CLIP-P across a little over 500 AML and about 20 normal hematopoietic CD34 plus cells. And we showed that CLIP-P was overexpressed in approximately 45% of patients, but its overexpression was independent of the different morphologic subtypes and independent of the different molecular mutations, again suggesting that the dysregulation of CLIP-P was due to things downstream of multiple genetic events. And we also showed that CLIP-P was equally expressed in both the stem cell as well as the, uh, um, the bulk fractions of AML. Getting back to our screen, then we went to validate the results of our screen and then use independent shRNA to knock down CLIP-P in across a range of leukemia cell lines. So we looked at TEX, OCML2, K562, and HL60, which have a range of CLIP-P expression, most notably HL60 cells, that have the lowest expression of CLIP-P in this group. And we see that target knockdown significantly reduces the growth of AML cells with the highest levels of CLIP-P, but HL60 cells that have low CLIP-P are largely resistant to the knockdown of the target, suggesting that maybe CLIP-P could ultimately serve as a biomarker to identify subgroups of patients most and least likely to respond. We also asked whether it was responsible um, for the growth of leukemia-initiating uh, cells, so we did similar knockdown experiments in tech cells, then engrafted the cells into the femur of the mice, and we showed that uh, knockdown of CLIP-P significantly reduced the engraftment of these cell lines, or these cells into mice. But in contrast to the effects on AML cells, CLIP-P knockout, at least in mouse models, seems to be particularly well tolerated. So CLIP-P knockout mice are viable to up to in over 400 days. They're slightly smaller than their wild-type counterparts, and they have acquired hearing loss and acquired infertility. But I would argue relative to acute leukemia, that's relatively mild. We also, though, and that was a published paper that came out just as we had uh, gotten interested in the target, but they hadn't looked at hematopoiesis, and so we obtained the CLIP-P knockout mice, and we looked at the hematopoietic system. And we showed that uh, CLIP-P knockout mice have normal blood counts, normal hemoglobin, normal platelets, and normal white cells, but they've also got normal stem cells and normal stem cell function, either as assessed by flow cytometry, by clonogenic growth assays, or by competitive repopulation studies. And so the best we can determine, although this is affecting AML cells and stem cells, CLIP-P knockout is not having a significant effect on normal hematopoiesis. And it's also interesting that there's a human condition where you can knock out CLIP-P, and, and there, these are rare, well, not knockout, but these are rare um, homozygous consanguineous families where the homozygous mutation, these individuals are viable. Again, they have acquired hearing loss and infertility, but otherwise relatively normal. 
One of the questions that this raised, though, for us is, so, so what is CLIP-P doing in the mitochondria? What are the, the substrates and what are the targets? And so to try to get at that question, we collaborated with Brian Rout and used a mass spectrometry approach called BioID. So in BioID, you take your cDNA of interest, infuse it to a promiscuous biotin ligase called BRA, and when you then overexpress the fusion of your biotin ligase and your uh, gene of interest, the biotin ligase will promiscuously biotinylate all the proteins interacting with your uh, protein of interest. And then so what we do operationally is we overexpress this in HEC293 cells. We then uh, lyse the cells, pull down the biotinylated proteins with streptavidin, and use mass spectrometry to identify them. And we then compared the interacting proteins with CLIP-P with a number of our controls. And we identified 49 proteins that preferentially interacted with CLIP-P compared to our various control setups. And gratifyingly, so the number one interacting protein was actually its known regulatory subunit CLIP-X, so we were qu quite excited about that. But then the other top interacting proteins were respiratory chain subunits, and in particular, the respiratory chain subunit SDHA was particularly enriched. So we went on to look at what effect was targeting CLIP-P having on respiratory chain 2 activity. And so we showed that inhibiting, uh, inhibiting CLIP-P by genetic knockdown impaired oxygen consumption, it reduced the enzymatic activity of complex 2, and it increased basal oxygen consumption, sorry, it increased mitochondrial ROS production consistent with inhibiting the complex. We also went to use native gels and looked at what was happening to complex 2, and particularly SDHA. And we showed that when we knocked down CLIP-P, we had the appearance of faster migrating bands on native gel. And so together, what we think is happening is that CLIP-P is a protease that's responsible for degrading misfolded or damaged respiratory chain two complex subunits. And when you inhibit CLIP-P, those damaged or misfolded complex subunits accumulate, they inhibit the activity of the complex, and that ultimately impairs respiratory chain function, causing cell death. One of the things that we wanted to do as well is take a small molecule approach to try to understand the effects of inhibiting CLIP-P to allow us to look at the effects of inhibiting CLIP-P in both AML and normal cells. But at the time, there were no uh, mitochondrial CLIP-P inhibitors that had been developed. But there was a bacterial CLIP-P inhibitor that was reported in the literature. And so we synthesized this uh, bacterial inhibitor, A23201, and we showed that it cross-reacted with mitochondrial CLIP-P. And we then used the compound to look at the effects on normal hematopoietic cells, as well as a series of AML patient samples with variable CLIP-P expression. And we saw that the small molecule had little to no effect on the normal hematopoietic cells, but it was able to induce cell death in the leukemic cells. And what we found is that the sensitivity to the small molecule correlated with CLIP-P expression. So the AML patient samples with the highest levels of CLIP-P were most sensitive to the molecule, whereas the AML patient samples with the lowest expression of the target were most resistant, again suggesting that this could serve as a potential biomarker. We also then went on to use the small molecule in our mouse models, and so here are a couple examples where we engrafted primary patient samples into mice, we treated the mouse with our compound, and then measured leukemic engraftment by flow cytometry. And in the samples that we looked at, and we're showing the primary engraftments here, but we also have secondary transplants, we can see significant reductions in the uh, leukemic burden in the mouse marrow. But one thing you'll notice is that it took 300 milligrams per kilogram of the drug. And the drug is at best a tool compound and maybe not that. You know, so within dissolving the compound in, into aqueous media, within an hour, the, uh, the compound degrades. And so you know, even as a tool, it's highly problematic. And so one of the things that we've been interested in doing is developing more potent, stable, and selective CLIP-P inhibitors. So here we've collaborated with the medicinal chemists who are at an institute across the street from us. And we established a, a high-throughput enzymatic screen based on the ability of CLIP-P to cleave a fluorogenic substrate, a, a trimer peptide. And we then used the cell free assay to screen 140,000 compounds to identify small molecule CLIP-P inhibitors. And we've since, you know, through validation studies, have gotten a number of uh, pharmaco uh, series that inhibit CLIP-P. We can also show that they inhibit the holoenzyme, the CLIP-XP, and with medicinal chemistry, we've now driven down the IC50s down to 10 nanomolar.
And in these compounds, we can now also show they engage clip P in cell free assays. They bind the target in intact cells. And we're starting to see that they induce cell death in a way that we think is consistent with inhibiting the target. So we continue to move these along as potential new therapeutic strategies for AML. Now, it's also a good point to point out, you know, we come back to the azocytidine and venetoclax story, you know, so how does this work? Well, at least to my good fortune, if not, if not Craig's, of all the things that this could do, turns out this, comp this combination, at least in part, is targeting respiratory chain uh, complexes, and particularly complex two. And so, uh, so Dan, Craig, and, and the group showed that, at least in part, the combination of venetoclax and azocytidine is decreasing the flux of metabolites into the TCA cycle, that decreases glutathione levels, that leads to blocks in glutathionation of complex two, and ultimately decreased complex two activity, which of course was a big paper for them, but very gratifying for our lab and really validates the whole path that we're taking. So very much appreciative of, of, of their work. Um, you know, but, but another way that we've been thinking about CLIP-P is in bacteria, inhibiting CLIP-P induces cell death. But a whole other strategy is to hyperactivate the protease. And there are these naturally occurring antimicrobials uh, called ADEPs that bind at the interface of ClipX and ClipXP. And when they bind ClipP at this interface, they cause the pore of the protease to enlarge, resulting in hyperactivation of the protease and increased degradation of its substrates. And, and so we wondered, what would happen if you hyperactivated the mitochondrial ClipP? And so, so we hypothesize that it would be the, the flip side of the same coin. While inhibiting ClipP, we've shown leads to the accumulation of misfolded and damaged respiratory chain subunits. We thought that hyperactivating the protease would actually lead to hyperactivation and hyperdegradation of these respiratory chain proteins, which in the end converges on impairing respiratory chain activity and inhibiting OxFos and cell death. And so recently, we've conducted a uh, chemical screen. We've now pulled out ClipP hyperactivators for time. I'm not going to have a chance to get into all the data. But to suffice it to say that, uh, that we were able to demonstrate the hypothesis that by opening the axial pore of the protease, we're able to demonstrate that these cells hyperdegrade respiratory subunits, cause cell death, and ultimately display efficacy in uh, primary ML patient samples over normals, and efficacy in vivo as well. But, ah, so I don't have to... Oh, actually, so I can take you through this. I, I didn't think I had the slides here. So, in fact, we, we had done a, a chemical screen uh, to, to identify activators of, of ClipP, and we pulled out uh, the amipridones, onc 201 that we show is hyperactivated and increase the cleavage of its um, peptide and protein substrates. Now, it turns out that onc 201 is an interesting molecule. So this is an am amipridone. It's being developed by a, com a company called uh, onco uh, Oncoceutics. And it's currently in a uh, clinical trial. But the mechanism of action of the drug was actually not well understood. And the company thought that it was working as an inhibitor of the dopamine receptor. But yet, it, it doesn't appear to be working that way because you can deplete the dopamine receptors and this drug continues to work equally well. But we actually showed that through uh, co-crystallography that the compound, again, was binding uh, ClipP at its interface with ClipX, resulting in enlargement of the axial pore and compaction of the protease. And that this is what we think is the mechanism of action of the uh, compound. But our work on ClipP has also gotten us interested in stuttering, stuttering, uh, studying the other mitochondrial proteases. And in fact, there are 20 mitochondrial proteases that are located in various compartments of the mitochondria. And we have been trying to take a similar bio-ID approach to map the interactomes and understand the mechanisms of these 20 proteases. So in addition to ClipP, we've now tested an additional uh, five, sorry, nine mitochondrial proteases. We've done about half in total of the mitochondrial proteases, and we're identifying new functions, new localizations, and new substrates for these proteases. And in closing, I, I want to share with you one of our stories that we're just finishing off, some of our unpublished work on uh, a protease called neurolysin. So neurolysin is a mitochondrial protein found in the matrix, but it can also be secreted. And when secreted into the plasma, it's known to regulate blood pressure and body temperature, and that's probably its best well-understood function. But its role when secreted is, uh, seems to be redundant because neurolysin knockout mice are fine with respect to body temperature, blood pressure, etc., and we showed by looking at AML patient databases, but also with protein, that uh, neurolysin is overexpressed in a subgroup of patients. And our bioID studies 
showed that it was interacting with respiratory chain complexes. So we said, ah, well, we've seen this sort of story before, and so we did the, uh, the effects of knocking down neurolysin, and we see that when we knock down neurolysin, we decrease basal oxygen consumption. So doing what we usually do then, we said, okay, well, now we'll look at levels of the respiratory chain complexes. So we looked at basal respiratory chain complex levels, and surprisingly to us, we saw no difference in the levels of the respiratory chains um, compared to the controls. So, so the MD-PhD student in my lab who's working on this, then so well, maybe instead of looking at basal levels of the complexes, we should look at respiratory chain supercomplexes. So traditionally, we think of respiratory chain supercomplexes, or the respiratory chain as being or organized as individual silos. That so each respiratory complex sits individually in the mitochondrial membrane. But newer data suggests that these, that these complexes can come together and organize as supercomplexes, where multimers of different respiratory chain complexes come together. Why these supercomplexes form and how they form is not well understood, but we think in part that it's due to increase the efficiency of oxidative phosphorylation and electron transport. And so we used native gels. We've done this so far on uh, cell lines. We've shown that when you knock down NLN, you significantly reduce, using native gels, these various combinations of respiratory chain complexes, including these super complexes. Of note, the only one where we didn't see changes is an SDHA. This is actually a uh, respiratory chain complex too that's not thought to be part of the super complexes. We also went on to look at respiratory chain super complexes in primary AML patient samples and normals. And we showed that the super complexes, at least in a subgroup of AML patients, were increased compared to normal hematopoietic cells. And quite interestingly, when we compare the expression of respiratory chain supercomplexes to neurolysin, we see a positive correlation. So the more neurolysin, the more respiratory chain supercomplexes. Again, consistent with neurolysin being an important regulator of supercomplex formation. So how might it be that neurolysin then affects the formation of supercomplexes? So we went back to the BioAD data that we had done that also identified interactions with respiratory chain subunits. And we looked at the top interactors. And one of the top interactors was the protein called Letum-1. And Letum-1 is actually a known regulator of respiratory chain supercomplex formation. And Letum-1 is known to form complexes with other proteins. Admittedly, what's in these proteins is not well, what's in these complexes is not well understood. But it forms both a minor and major complex depending on which proteins are associated with it. So using, again, native gels, we looked at the effects of knockdown of NLN on the formation of respiratory chain supercomplexes. And we can see that knockdown of NLN impairs letum one formation that then we think is the mechanism by which this is now impacting respiratory chain supercomplexes. Finally, we looked at what effect was knockdown of NLN having on the growth and viability of AML cells. And so we looked at a series of AML patient samples using SHRNA, we knocked down the target, and we can see reduced growth and viability of our tested cell lines. We also looked at the impact on the uh, leukemia-initiating cells, again, similar experiments, knocked down NLN and graft the cells into mice, and we can see in decreased engraftment of the cells into the mouse marrow. Finally, though, we were interested, again, using a chemical approach, and there was a reported allosteric inhibitor of neurolysin, um, but they had really actually never looked at this in uh, cell context. All of the, this was a biochemical study conducted in cell-free assays. And, and so we synthesized the uh, neurolysin inhibitor that had been reported, and we looked at the effects of AML cell lines, and we can show, similar to what we showed with the genetic knockdown, that when you treat AML cells with this neurolysin inhibitor, you get impairment in respiratory chain supercomplex formation, we get decreased oxygen consumption, and we also get decreased growth of the leukemia cell lines. And finally, in, in experiments just completed very recently, we also looked at the effects on, in vivo, and so we dose mice with 100 milligrams per kilogram of the neurolysin inhibitor, five of seven days. These are OCML2 cells xenografted into mice, and we see significant reductions in delay in leukemia growth compared to controls without toxicity. We've now got the primary patient samples and grafting into mice, and we, over the next few weeks, we'll see what happens in those as well. So over the last 50 minutes or so, try to give you a sense of some of the work that we're doing in AML. And we think that you know, our better understanding of genomics in AML has led to new prognostic markers and new therapeutic strategies.
But having said that, I think we've hit a plateau, at least in terms of genomics, as to what we're going to be able to do in terms of targeted therapeutics. And so instead, I think we need to think of things that are downstream of these genetic mutations. I think, at least in part, mitochondrial metabolism may be a, tra a viable or, or, or an attractive vulnerability uh, for leukemia cells and stem cells. And I think that, at least based on some of the work and others that we and others have done, that targeting different mitochondrial pathways, whether it's in protein synthesis or mitochondrial protein degradation, may be useful therapeutic approaches, at least for some leukemias. And finally, I just want to acknowledge all the people who have really contributed and really done this work. I want to thank Marco Skirtish, a uh, MD-PhD student who initiated the work on tigacycline and mitochondrial protein synthesis. Alicia Cole has been uh, the one who spearheaded our work on the mitochondrial protease clip P. And Sarah Morelli, another MD-PhD student who is working on a neurolicense story. And Aaron Botham, who did our bio-ID work on all our mitochondrial proteases. Uh, Sarah Zarabi, who led our work on uh, hyperactivating CLIP-P. And that's the group in my lab, and certainly our collaborators across Toronto, Canada, the U.S., and beyond. We could, certainly couldn't have done the work without them. And finally, thank you very much for, for your attention and inviting me to speak today. You know, I, you know, I, so the answer is I, I don't know why some uh, leukemic cells have such a, a dysregulated reliance on mitochondria. You know, I, I still believe that leukemia is a genetic disease, that acquired mutations lead to leukemia. But you know, there seems to be no relation between the leukemic mutations and the mitochondrial dysfunction. And I also don't think it can be simply explained by a microenvironment factor. So I'm actually unsure, and it'd be interesting to get other people's opinions, but, but why are leukemic cells have this unique reliance on oxidative phosphorylation? Maybe it's epigenetic. And why then are they different than the normal cells? And, and, and I think understanding that is key, although I've got to tell you, we don't have any good answers. Just, just to add one more layer, though, to the, to the video clock and the setting story, we need, the surprise isn't that those, well, the, the surprise there um, relates to moving to an in vivo context. So the, the preclinical work, video clocks alone recapitulates all the mitochondrial inhibitory activity that we observed more recently in patients. The surprise was when, when you go in vivo, it doesn't work as well. And the addition of azacitidine somehow magically brings back Lost somehow moving in vivo. So that, that was, I wasn't entirely lucky yet. But mechanistically, the preclinical data actually did predict that. So that was my comment. The question was um, what we continue to be surprised about is the difference between the normal and relapse specimens. So I wonder, with respect to your take a cycling activity, or, or actually uh, any of the beautiful characters you showed us, does any of the biology that's stratified by, by Richard de Novo versus? You know, it's a good question, and we have largely focused on de novo disease because those are the bulk of the samples we have. And while we do have relapse samples, they're being prioritized for paired, you know, probably usually genetic studies of diagnosis relapse. And so we haven't done as much, you know, unlike your group, in the relapse setting. But, I mean, there's no reason to think that the biology at relapse is going to be the same as a diagnosis. And, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, one of the simple answers is, so why did your tigacycline work in your trial? Well, maybe it's because, again, relapse disease biology is completely different than de novo. We did all our preclinical work on the uh, de novo disease. Yes? So we think that there's a subset. Uh, it's a good question. So, so we think there's a subset th that, more broadly speaking, has a greater reliance on oxidative phosphorylation compared to others, and it's, you know, in our hands, about 50, 50 or so. We think characterizing that, for us, what's important is the decreased spare reserve capacity. And, and, and that, as a, you know, for reasons, again, that we don't understand, but I, I think the work... Um, you know, 
by Craig's group, but also by the Gottlieb group, has kind of sort of shed light as to why that may be, that they may have that lower reserve capacity. That's the subgroup that I think targeting mitochondrial pathways would be particularly sensitive in. The question is when becomes a good biomarker for that. You're not going to really, in a clinical setting, do reserve capacity, but there may be other things like expression of CLIPI or other targets that are more readily uh, measured. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Yes. CML. So, um, so, so we've done nothing in the CML space, you know, but um, so, so, so we have Gottlieb's group recently published the work looking at the flux of metabolites into the TCA cycle and then showed that CML cells and also CML stem cells, the flux of metabolites of glucose into the TCA cycle was greater in those cells compared to normal cells and normal stem cells. And the reason that they thought that was particularly interesting is that if you simultaneously inhibited uh, imatinib and targeted oxidative phosphorylation, you could eradicate the CML stem cell, which in the CML field now is currently one of the hot items because so CML generally is not curable with TKIs alone, but the, but the hypothesis, if you add the TKI with the oxphos inhibitor, at least for some CML, you may be able to eliminate the stem cell. So that's kind of what's known a little bit to my understanding about mitochondria and CML. In regards to the mitochondrial protease, um, do you think with the inhibition versus hyperactivation, you're going to get different clones, or is it more going to be your reliance on that protein alone, like with the clones that had the higher um, expression were more inhibited? <laughs> So, so, so my guess is it's going to target the same group. Uh, what, what we don't know at this point is what's going to have greater efficacy versus greater toxicity. So on the toxicity side, the human in knockout mice would support inhibitors as being very well tolerated. I must say on the efficacy side, the fact that there's this molecule in clinic showing some degrees of efficacy is very attractive for hyperactivating it. And we actually think from a biology perspective, it's actually very cool that you can, eat, you can modulate respiratory chain proteins, either prevent their degradation or promote their hyperdegradation by targeting a protease. And, and there's some other examples, you know, probably in biology, PARP would be one that either inhibiting or hyperactivating PARP can have anti-cancer effects. Turned out that I think at least part of the magic there was the proteasome in a cancer cell was actually structurally different in different constituents. Do you think something similar might be going on with the mitochondrial proteasome? So, so, so to the best of our knowledge, that they haven't identified other regulatory subunits that may be more active in AM, malignant versus normal. We think it's more an expression issue, that they're, that they're overexpressed, they're more dependent on it, and that the mitochondria, so, so, so although there's actually no correlation between molecular subtypes, CLIP-P is actually highest in patient samples with increased mitochondrial stress or mitochondrial UPR. And so we think there's a subset of mitochondria that are under stress. The role of CLIP-P is to defend that stress and those are the patients where targeting this may be particularly useful. Great. Thank you.